Dr. Avan Asu is chairman and CEO of Sage Policy Group, an economic policy consulting firm in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, he serves as chief economist to the Associated Builders and Contractors and chief economic advisor to the Construction Financial Management Association. He has four graduate degrees, including a JD and a PhD. It's now my pleasure to turn over the program to him for his economic update and forecast presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for the opportunity to be here with you today. Hopefully you can see that. Hopefully you can see my screen. If you can't see it, please tell me. But my name is Ani yes, Bambasu. Yeah. Great, great. My name is Ani Bambasu. I am an economist. Please hold any further applause. And I want to thank the Washington Building Congress for inviting me and uh, an opportunity to speak, uh, giving me an opportunity to speak to the organization's most important stakeholders. I want to talk about the economy today, of course. I want to focus very much on things like building construction, uh, but other aspects of economic life. My presentation is entitled Aniban Basu and the Chamber of Data. This is a Harry Potter themed presentation, and you will see that theming throughout the presentation, whether you like it or not. I hope you don't hate it, but it is sort of baked into the cake. I'll be leaving at the end of this uh, period. Uh, we're supposed to end at around uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, about 10 minutes for Q&A. So please think about the questions you'd like to ask uh, because we will have a, a Q&A session. Actually, I hope to leave a bit more than 10 minutes, but we shall see where this goes. A lot of waterfront to cover. Now, I think we would agree from an economic perspective that the most influential factor shaping economic outcomes continues to be COVID-19, and in particular, the behavioral changes that the pandemic has wrought. We have, of course, over the past year plus, been prisoners of our own house cabans, um, you know, sort of disengaged, at least partially from the economy because of various lockdown measures. Many people don't need lockdown measures to disengage. They're simply nervous about infections. They're also nervous about vaccinations, but uh, there have been major behavioral shifts. And of course, those have had major economic implications. And we'll talk about at least some of them. Now, it has been a shared global pandemic, but the response of various people to the pandemic has been so different in nature across governments, across nations, within neighborhoods. Uh, and so when you have different responses to a common phenomenon, you will ultimately have very different economic outcomes. And that's exactly what we've observed since the pandemic turned the economy upside down and inside out. This comes from the International Monetary Fund. It's a reflection of 2020 growth for various societies around the world. Green is good here because green signifies growth. And you see some green here. There were some nations that managed to expand economically in 2020. Most prominent of these is China, home to the world's second largest economy. China expands 2.3% in 2020. It's not alone. Laos expands economically. Vietnam grows 2.9%. The Taiwanese economy grows 3%. East of the Caspian Sea, you can see nations like Kazakhstan and uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, um, uh, you know, having decent years, especially Turkmenistan uh, and Uzbekistan. These are natural resource intensive countries. Uh, in Western Africa, you can see various nations expanding economically as well, including the Ivory Coast, which as a single man, I refer to as the Cote d'Ivoire as part of a broader strategy. In any case, not a very effective strategy. Red is bad here because red signifies that economy shrank. And you see a lot of red here, of course, including in the New World, both in uh, South America and in North America. I can offer you some additional granularity around this. So same data source, the International Monetary Fund, but this time I'm actually showing you numbers. If you look toward the bottom of the slide, you can see that 2.3% estimated growth rate for China. The US economy is estimated, including by our own Commerce Department, as having shrunk 3.5%. We were not the worst performers in North America. The Canadian economy shrinking 5.4%, the Mexican economy 8.2%. And North America was not the worst performer. Italy shrinking nearly 9%, France 8%, uh, Spain 11%, and the United Kingdom um, having its worst year since 1709, uh, that, of course, the year of the Great Frost. So uh, Europe may actually be the worst performers over the course of the pandemic, at least they were in 2020. Now, for me to suggest to you that the U.S. economy shrank 3.5% last year is A, accurate, but B, misses out on a ton of nuance. Yes, 
There were moments during which the U.S. economy was perfectly dismal in its performance last year, but there are also moments uh, during which the U.S. economy bounced back very forcefully. This is quarterly GDP growth. Now, there are two colors of vertical bars here, blue and red. The blue colored bars stretch until the fourth quarter of 2019, the last pre-pandemic quarter. Uh, and those blue color bars are indexed to the left hand vertical axis. There are four red colored bars here, and they are respectively the first, second, third, and fourth quarters of 2020, and those are indexed to the right hand vertical axis. I had to bifurcate the vertical axis, which sounds and is excruciatingly painful. Now, you'll remember that coming into 2020, we had plentiful momentum. The principal issue among employers coming in 2020 was what? I can't find workers to support my growth. Indeed, some employers are having a similar problem today for reasons we can get into. But the point is we entered 2020 with massive momentum. We had jobs in January of 2020. We had 289,000 jobs in February of 2020. But we shut down the economy in March. And the last three weeks of March are so horrific, March of last year, uh, that it takes the entire uh, the entire uh, quarter down with this statistically during the first quarter of 2020 the u.s economy shrinks five percent on an annualized basis now that's a big news item in and of its own right uh, during the fourth quarter of 2008 which was the worst quarter of our economic lives until recently the u.s economy shrinks 8.4 percent during the worst of that again global financial crisis so a negative five percent print is a big deal but this time unfortunately it was merely the appetizer for during the second quarter of 2020, the U.S. economy shrinks 31.4% on an annualized basis, which is why I had to bifurcate the vertical axis, because if I try to graph a statistic of that magnitude on a single unified vertical axis, a lot of these other vertical bars simply disappear. And around this time, there's this great debate within the economics community about what the initial phase of recovery would look like. Would it be U-shaped, L-shaped, Nike swoosh, square root, hockey stick, checkmark? It was a straight up V, V for vibrancy uh, uh, or vitality or restoration partially thereof. For during the third quarter of 2020, this economy bounces back growing 33.4% on an annualized basis. Demonstrating that under the right conditions, the US economy is capable of enormous recuperative power. Now, why does that matter? It matters because that will shape our forecast for 2021 and into 2022. Now, for reasons we'll get into, by the fourth quarter, the US economy is losing momentum. Uh, retail sales by this point are starting to slump. By December, we're losing jobs again. We lost 306,000 jobs in December of 2020. Um, and so, uh, you know, by the fourth quarter, the US economy is decelerating now with a growth rate of 4.3%. Nonetheless, there is growth during the latter half of the year, but despite that growth, the U.S. economy ends the year smaller than it began the year, and there are many implications to a shrunken economy. Let's talk about some of them. Let's begin with a discussion of the labor market. So this next slide will have the same setup. Instead of quarterly GDP, however, this is now monthly jobs. So same setup here. The blue colored bars are indexed to the left-hand axis. The red colored bars are indexed to the right-hand axis. The last blue colored bar here is February of 2020, February of last year. February of 2020, again, was a month during which we added 289,000 jobs, lots of momentum. You remember that in 2020, coming into the year, we had more job openings than we had unemployed people in America, to the tune of 7.3 million job openings versus 5.8 million unemployed folks toward the end of 20, uh, 2019. Uh, so we're adding jobs in January and February. February of 2020 represented the 113th consecutive month of job growth in America. Uh, over that 113 month period, this nation added 22 million jobs. We drove the official rate of unemployment in this country down to 3.5%. That was a 50 year low. You'd have to go back to December of 1969 to find unemployment as low as it had been pre-crisis. And just to give you a sense of how long ago that was, the Orioles were good back then. It was a long time ago. Again, we shut down the economy in March of 2020. The first red colored bar is March of 2020, again, indexed to the right-hand vertical axis. And in March of 2020, this nation loses 1.7 million jobs. But that is misleading. 
because the so-called reference week, the week during which the underlying survey was conducted was relatively early in March. So a lot of the jobs lost in March didn't show up in that March jobs report. They would show up in the April of 2020 jobs report, along with some of the jobs lost in April, of course. And in April of 2020, this nation loses 20.7 million jobs. So if you do the math on that, between March and April of last year, we lose as many jobs as we had added for the previous 113 months. Around that time, the Wall Street Journal conducted a survey of economists, mostly economists who work for large U.S. financial institutions, not small business operators like myself, and those economists collectively projected that the economy would lose another 8 million jobs in May of 2020. But they were wrong. We did not lose 8 million jobs in May of 2020. We added 2.8 million jobs, followed by 4.8 million jobs in June, and 1.7 million jobs in July, and 1.6 million jobs in August and 716,000 jobs in September, and 680,000 jobs in October, a smashing performance. Now again, by the end of last year, we're losing momentum, and by December, we're actually losing jobs. The Congress passes, the then president signs on December 27th, another stimulus package, and we've been adding jobs ever since, culminating with the March jobs report of 916,000. March, of course, the month during which the new president, Joe Biden, uh, also signs uh, another stimulus package. More on that in a moment. But though the initial phase of recovery has been V-shaped, please don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting in any way that we're anywhere close to complete recovery. If you compare February of 2020 employment versus March of 2021, we're still down 8.4 million jobs over that 13-month basis. February of 2020 was the last pre-pandemic month in North America, March of 2021, the last month for which we have data. The sector losing the most jobs, according to these horizontal bars, leisure and hospitality, down 3.1 million jobs. Who are these folks? These are your restaurant and hotel workers. Government losing a ton of jobs. Uh, that's state and local government jobs, of course, because state and local governments have to balance their budgets with limited exception each and every fiscal year. So if the revenues are not there, the cost must be cut. And the cost of government often takes the form of human capital. So who gets cut? Teachers, teachers' aides police officers, firefighters, bus drivers, garbage collectors, so on and so forth. And you can see here, every major sector of the economy lost jobs over this period. What about the Washington metropolitan area, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's my next slide. Between February of 2020 and March of 2021, the Washington metropolitan area loses 205,000 jobs, equivalent to 6.1% of its pre-existing base of employment. In fact, and this may surprise many of you, the Washington metropolitan area has lost a higher fraction of its pre-existing employment base than has the balance of the country, despite being the seat of the federal government. That seems strange, but one of the aspects of the Washington metropolitan area is that it has a massive leisure and hospitality sector. Lots of restaurants, lots of hotels. Uh, and of course, many of those restaurants and hotels cater, among other things, to global travelers, and global travel has been effectively shut down. So you can see that not quite half of all the jobs lost in the Washington area over the past 12 months have been, or I should say over the past 13 months, have been in that leisure and hospitality category. Now this gives you some more perspective from a regional, uh, uh, on a regional basis. This is employment growth for the 25 largest metropolitan areas, again, for that, for that February 2020 to March of 2021 period. Now this is a mistitled slide, that's for sure. There's no growth here. Not one of the nation's 25 largest metropolitan areas has added jobs on this 13-month basis, but some regions have held on to more of their pre-existing employment base than others. Who's at number one here? San Antonio, Texas, losing only 2.3% of its employment over this 13-month period. Who is the governor of Texas? That's right, it's Greg Abbott. Greg Abbott has been one of these governors very keen on keeping his economy open during the crisis. At number two, Tampa. Not enough that they won a Super Bowl, uh, they also had one of the stronger economies during the pandemic. Who's the governor of Florida? That's right, Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis, again, one of these governors very key on keeping his economy open. Number three is Dallas, again, that's Texas and Greg Abbott. And number four, Phoenix. Who is the governor uh, of Arizona? Correct again, it is Doug Ducey. Doug Ducey, one of these governors, again, very keen, very eager to keep his economy open. Fast forward to number seven, Atlanta, Georgia. Who is the governor of Georgia? The famous or infamous Brian Kemp. 
Brian Kemp was the first to reopen his economy, it happened on April 20th of last year. Sometimes you will hear Georgians suggest that they never really shut down their economy, though the Atlanta area did, or at least parts of the Atlanta area did. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, you know, Atlanta, I mean, Atlanta City might have shut down, but the Atlanta region holds up uh, and losing 4.9% of its job. So some governors have been more focused on the economic uh, and employment outcomes. Other governors more focused on the public health outcomes. At number 25 at the bottom of the second column, Orlando, Florida. He said, Anibon, what gives? What's your narrative here? Because same state, Florida, same governor, Ron DeSantis. What gives, of course, is the structure of the Orlando metropolitan area economy, which is about theme parks, niche hospitality, retail trade. It's about in-person experience, not about remote work. And of course, the major policymaker in Orlando is not Ron DeSantis or the mayor of Orlando. It's Disney. And Disney was shut down early in the crisis and then continues to maintain limited capacity. At number 23, San Francisco. At number 24, Los Angeles, losing more than one in 10 of their pre-existing uh, jobs. Uh, who is the governor of California? Why, it's the wickedly handsome Gavin Newsom. Gavin Newsom himself could be a Hollywood actor. He has been very aggressive in keeping the California economy shut down during the crisis. Not himself shut down, a bit of the animal, but the economy shut down. At number 22, New York Metro. Who's the governor of New York? Well, who doesn't know these days? It's Andrew Cuomo. His counterpart in New Jersey, Phil Murphy, very aggressive in keeping that economy shut down. And of course, the New York, uh, New York metropolitan area, particularly New York City, emerged as an early stage viral epicenter. At number 21, Boston. Who's the governor of Massachusetts? None other than Charlie Baker. Happens to be a Republican, very aggressive in keeping that economy shut down. So again, some governors focus on the economic and employment outcomes, trying to limit job loss and unemployment during the crisis. Other governors looking to try to prevent infections and, and higher infection rates, positivity rates. And so that has very much shaped these data, along with other factors, such as the structure of these regional economies. Unemployment. As I mentioned earlier, we start the crisis out with a 3.5% rate of unemployment. By April of 2020, that's the big peak you see here, it's 14.7%. Now here I'm offering you some additional granularity. I'm showing you male unemployment in blue, female unemployment in green, and overall unemployment in red. So during the previous economic downturn, the so-called Great Recession, men suffered relatively more, and this had much to do with construction. Uh, construction is a sector that is almost nine-tenths male. Uh, about 87% of construction workers are men. Uh, and construction during the period of its downturn, which overlapped with the Great Recession, it was actually longer than the Great Recession, uh, construction lost 2.3 million jobs. Uh, and so male unemployment rises faster. This time was different. It's leisure and hospitality, retail trade, salons, daycare centers, private schools, some public school districts. A lot of uh, female dominated occupation categories were implicated directly by this downturn. So in April, while the overall unemployment rate is 14.7%, the female rate of unemployment is 16.1% that month. For men that month, it was 13.6%. Now you can see the progress that's been made since that time. By March of 2021, the unemployment rate is back down to 6%, which when I was growing up would have been considered quite a favorable outcome. And you know, a part of my childhood, uh, was watching Jimmy Carter in action. In any case, um, now this is somewhat misleading uh, because since February of 2020, about 3.9 million Americans have left the labor force on net. So if you added those folks back into the ranks of job seekers, the rate of unemployment would be closer to 9%, which is probably a better indicator of where the economy is right now. Nonetheless, if you flip this line upside down and why on God's green earth would you do that? It's because in this instance, less is more. The lower the number, the better. So if you flip this line upside down, you would see what? The letter V, again, for vibrancy or vitality or partial restoration thereof. Unemployment for the same 25 large metropolitan areas. Just wanted to give you a peek at the Washington metropolitan area number. Just came out a few days ago, March of 2021, 5.6%. In my region, Baltimore, 5.7%. The lowest here, again, in Brian Kemp's Georgia, Atlanta at 4.1%. This is for the Atlanta region, not just the city of Atlanta. The highest unemployment rate, predictably, in the state of California, where Gavin Newsom reigns, at least for now. So um, there's some other implications beyond the labor market, of course, of COVID-19. And one of them is that the federal government was very much involved in our lives last year, more than usual, uh, from a public health perspective and also from an economic one. Now, if you're familiar with the Harry Potter books and movies, 
then you're familiar with the fact that there is a ministry of magic in that series. And I'm not sure how much magic comes out of Washington, D.C., but I can tell you this, many dollars are flowing out of Washington, D.C. Last year, we saw the passage of three major stimulus packages. The first was signed by Donald Trump on March 27th, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act. This was a 2.2 to 2.3 trillion dollar package. This was the model. This became the model for all subsequent stimulus packages, at least those stimulus packages to date. This included direct payments to Americans. Americans love direct payments, $1,200. This included extended and enhanced unemployment insurance, including up until July of last year, $600 a week enhanced federal benefit on top of state unemployment insurance benefits. This, of course, included paycheck protection, more grants and loans to small businesses and large businesses alike. Uh, some aid to state and local governments, but that was prescribed money, not general fund relief, largely to bulk up health care delivery capacity. Less than a month later, on April 24th, more stimulus is injected into the economy. Uh, but then after April of last year, for many months, no additional stimulus was legislated by Congress. By that point, of course, the economy is recovering. We added those 4.8 million jobs in June. Unemployment is falling. We seem to be off to the races. But by the fourth quarter of last year, economic momentum is waning. That stimulus has worked its way through the economy. Retail sales begin to slump. We start losing jobs by January. So sensing that the economic recovery was falling apart on December 27th, nine months after he signs the CARES Act, Donald Trump signs the Consolidated Appropriations Act. This is a $906 billion package. Helps explain why we added jobs in January and February and March as well. Again, more direct payments to Americans, more extended and enhanced unemployment benefits, rental assistance, more grants and loans to small businesses and large businesses alike. Now, all this news has been trumped by the newest stimulus package, one signed by Joe Biden on March 11th. This is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. This is a $1.9 trillion package. Guess what? More direct payments to Americans, more extended and enhanced unemployment insurance. But this one was different in at least one major way. Direct aid to state and local governments. Now, again, there was a lot of money flowing from federal coffers to state and local governments last year, but it was prescribed money. It was designated for specific purposes, particularly with respect, with respect to public health. This is different. This is general fund relief. Here you go, governor. Here you go, mayor, madam mayor. Uh, here's some money for you. Spend it as you will, by and large. There's very few restrictions on this money. Uh, and, and there was a big debate on Capitol Hill last year about not wanting to do this. Why? Because we don't want to bail out New Jersey and Illinois. Do you remember that? A lot of people say we don't want to offer general fund relief because we don't want to bail out states like New Jersey and Illinois. As it turns out, there's a fair amount of antipathy toward people uh, in, from New Jersey and Illinois in this country, which I think is perfectly crazy, as those are most exquisite people, at least those folks from Illinois. This also includes more money for education, small businesses, so on and so forth. It's a big package. Now, the Biden administration, of course, is talking about further stimulus, including a now a, a new $1.8 trillion family investment package uh, that will include all kinds of money uh, for all kinds of things like uh, free tuition at community colleges, so on and so forth. And then on top of that, a roughly $2 to $2.5 uh, $2 trillion infrastructure package money to be spent over eight years and to be funded by corporate tax increases in large measure. So more stimulus is on the way. It would appear the Democrats have shown that they can pass major legislation without one Republican vote in the House and without one Republican vote in the Senate. Now, you could ask the question, are we being Dumbledore? So Aldous Dumbledore, as you may know, was the headmaster of Hogwarts School. Hogwarts, the school for witches and wizards made famous by the Harry Potter books and movies. I'm told the greatest headmaster in Hogwarts history. We entered the crisis with a $23.5 trillion national debt. The chart suggests that we're screaming towards $28 trillion, but as it turns out, we're now past $28 trillion, headed towards $30 trillion by the end of the current federal fiscal year, which ends on September 30th. I was taught in economics there is no free lunch. So I presume that at some point in the future, we're going to have to pay this back in one way or another, if not literally, then in some other fashion. Uh, maybe we're having to print money to get ourselves out of a debt crisis. But the point is, you can ask the question, are we being Dumbledore? And we might get back to, to this discussion uh, during Q&A, which is about 18 minutes away. Now, there are some other implications uh, to 
uh, to COVID-19. And now we start to march toward the discussion in which you might have most interest that relates to real estate and construction. Now, one of the aspects of 2020 was that we suffered uh, a lot of retail bankruptcy. Retail sector was among those that were cursed by this pandemic. So here's a list of some of the large retailers that went bankrupt in 2020. So back in February of 2020, before the crisis really becomes one in North America, Pier 1 Imports goes bankrupt, closing all of its stores, so you can still buy the merchandise online. In April, True Religion, the supplier of those most excellent jeans that make everyone look slender, they go bankrupt in April. Then sequentially, J. Crew, Neil Marcus, and J.C. Penney go bankrupt in May. GMC, the supplier of those most excellent supplements that many of us take, those pills that many of us take to, for instance, build up musculature. I pop them like crazy. I still have the arms of an accountant for whatever reason. They go bankrupt in June. Brooks Brothers goes bankrupt in July. Lord & Taylor, that hallowed department store, goes bankrupt in August. And then late last year, Francesca's, uh, which is one of my daughter's all-time favorites. So judging from their spending patterns, many of these are their all-time favorites. They go bankrupt on December 3rd. So we suffered a lot of large-scale retail bankruptcy. This much is known. But what many people may not realize, may not realize, is that last year was a good one for retail sales. Unable to take vacations, unable to go to ballparks and buy $7 hot dogs, we actually had a lot of money on which to spend on retail items. This is monthly retail sales, back to March of 2000, so 21 years of data here. Now, it's true, there were, was a period during which retail sales were slumping. It begins in February of 2020. Why February of 2020? Indeed, the National Bureau of Economic Research indicates that the recession began in February of 2020. So let's do some rewinding here. What's going on in February of 2020? Well, by this point, you and I have heard about COVID-19. Some people are beginning to partially withdraw from the economy. They're nervous about infection. They're not shopping as much. They're canceling vacations or having vacations canceled upon them. Then retail sales fall off the table in March and April of last year as we shut down the economy in earnest. But lo and behold, what do you see here? A V-shaped recovery. By June of last year, retail sales are actually above the pre-recession peak, and they keep climbing from that point forward. Infused with stimulus, households spend a ton of money. Look at the March retail sales from this year, the last bar on this slide. They're through the roof. And of course, that's, that's the month that Joe Biden signed that newest package, that American Rescue Plan Act, more stimulus payments to Americans. So we had two or three bad months of retail sales, and yet we had all this retail bankruptcy. How do we reconcile that? Well, ask yourself the question, who won retail market share in 2020? And this, of course, has some impact on commercial construction going forward. So here I'm showing you U.S. retail sales by type of business. These horizontal bars represent the percentage change in retail sales by category for the period February 2020, pre-pandemic, versus March of 2021, latest data point. Now, there was a brick and mortar category at the very top of the list, sporting goods, hobby, book, and music stores. What is that about? Sales of 44% over this period. That's about the sale of Peloton bikes and other exercise equipment. If you couldn't go to the gym, people brought the gym into their homes. At number two, of course, the internet. That's Amazon, Jeff Bezos, e-commerce, any market share. Jeff Bezos and Amazon were among the winners in 2020. Jeff Bezos is doing so well. He doesn't have to be CEO of Amazon anymore. I think he probably has enough on which to retire by this point. And number three, building material and garden supplies dealers. What's that about? Who are these folks? Home Depot and Lowe's. So what did we do a lot of last year? We spent a lot of time at home. What do people do when they're at home? They notice all the things in their house that aren't quite right. And ultimately that translates into someone, maybe a contractor, going to Home Depot. Now, who do you see at the bottom here? What's at the bottom? Food services and drinking places. Food services and drinking places. Um, uh, most human beings refer to that as restaurants and bars. We economists call that food services and drinking places, which is one of the many reasons many of us have never been on a date. And then clothing and clothing accessory stores. They have not fared particularly well. March 2021, as it turns out, was a big month for apparel sales. So it actually makes the performance look better. But up until March, it was the most performing sector. Why? Because we're not in each other's presence. We don't have to impress anyone. No one's judging us by our appearance right now. They can't see us. I mean, question for you, am I wearing pants? You don't know, and I shall not be telling. So the, the point is there are winners and losers, and the losers are associated with those bankruptcies. So again, that's your J. Crew and Neiman Marcus and Lord and & Taylor and Francesca's, those folks that depend disproportionately on apparel sales or exclusively on apparel sales. Okay, 
more implications of, um, of 2020 and COVID-19. Let's get to the real estate discussion now before we end with the forecast. So if you're familiar with the Harry Potter books and movies, you know that every student admitted, every witch or wizard admitted to Hogwarts is allocated into one of four houses. There is Hufflepuff, there's Gryffindor, uh, and indeed Harry Potter is a member of Gryffindor House along with his two best friends, Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger. I'm from Baltimore, and every wizard from Baltimore is allocated into Ravenclaw. That's just the way it is. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just telling you the rules. If you don't like it, you can take it up with the Hogwarts administration. There's some other rules. If you're from Pittsburgh, you're in Slytherin. And again, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just telling you what the rules are so you know. But uh, And again, you can take it up with the administration if you don't like it. Now, one of the other aspects of 2020 was that the cost of capital was further suppressed. Here I'm showing you two interest rates of interest. I'm showing you the 30-year fixed mortgage rate in blue and the 15-year fixed mortgage rate in red. And as it turns out, mortgage rates were low coming into the crisis. They became even lower during the crisis. That should not surprise anyone in this audience that home prices were rising prior to the pandemic. Well, of course they were. We're getting lots of jobs. Wages are rising rapidly in the context of low unemployment. Mortgage rates are favorable prior to the crisis. And the inventory of unsold homes was low. I think one could view it as somewhat surprising that the pace of home price appreciation has accelerated during the crisis, though we're down 8.4 million jobs and the labor market or the labor force has shrunk. This is the S&P Case-Shiller U.S. National Home Price Index providing a basis for what I just suggested. You can see in 2020 that rapid appreciation of home prices. This is something you know, you've heard of. Now, home builders know it as well. They understand that the inventory of unsold homes is low and the appetite to purchase homes is very elevated. Why? Well, mortgage rates are low, of course, and this is one way, the way to take advantage of low mortgage rates. One of the ways, I guess you can refinance existing mortgages too. But then more people want to aggressively social distance during the pandemic. It's easier to do that from a home than an apartment building. More people want more space attached to their residence. Of course, they're spending more time at home. They need room for a home office or a home gym. And then demographics. The oldest of the millennials will turn 40 this year. The most common age in America this year is 29. We have more 29-year-olds rac racing around than any other age. The second most common age in America is 30. The third most common age in America is 28. Five years ago, the most common age in America was 24. What do 24-year-olds do? Lots of nonsense. But they might rent an apartment. And that coincided with the apartment building boom that we saw during the previous decade, including in Washington, D.C. But in five years, the most common age will be 34. And what do 34 year olds do? Well, still lots of nonsense, but they might purchase a home. And we're now in that transitional point. Now, this, among other things, is triggering a supply side response. I will show you a number of leading indicators as I march through the final 10 minutes or so of my presentation. Here's one of them. This is US residential building permits. It's a leading indicator because a builder has to pull a permit before they build something. The segment of interest here is in red. The red segment pertains to single unit structures, single family home construction, whether townhomes or detached. Now, prior to the crisis, prior to the pandemic, there was some surge in single family building permits. Then, of course, that surge goes away during the early stages of the pandemic. Lots of uncertainty, lots of government offices that issue such permits close. But then what do you see again? The letter V, if you look at this chart carefully enough. So now I've shown you a number of things. Gross domestic product employment growth, unemployment rates decline, retail sales, and now residential building permits, all manifesting that V-shaped recovery. And I keep bringing this up because this will help inform our forecast for 2021 into 2022. You can see the permitting, generally speaking, has continued to climb. February of 2021 was somewhat weak because of the wintry weather in Texas and other parts of the American South. But builders understand that there's an opportunity here to meet unmet demand. Their challenge, of course, is construction materials prices including softwood lumber, which as you know, has added about 24% to the cost of constructing the typical single family home. But the demand is there. And the demand is there as in part because of these new migration patterns in America. This is US migration in metropolitan areas, 2020 versus 2019. This is in millions. So the red colored bar here represents the 2 million people who moved out of principal cities last year, whether New York or San Francisco, Boston or Chicago. The blue colored bar here reflects the roughly 3 million people who moved into suburbs. Some people move from rural areas, many people move from urban areas, but the suburbs won 
residential market share. So this previous decade, the decade now ended, was about apartment construction in large US cities. This decade will be about suburban housing. And again, part of this is temporary. It's driven by pandemic and the desire to social distance, but part of this is permanent and driven by the demographics of the millennials, our largest generation. Now, this migration has many economic implications. One of the things that's happened is that proximity is now viewed as less valuable. Ask yourselves the question, why is Manhattan so expensive? Manhattan is expensive because it's home to Wall Street, a very large labor market, or I should say a very large uh, employment base. It's home to the two largest central business districts in the country which of course, Midtown Manhattan and then the Financial District. It's home to Broadway, it's home to Central Park, it's proximate. But in a world of remote working, in a world of online sales, and in a world of streaming of Netflix, proximity becomes less valuable, and this shows up in many different ways, including in apartment rents. This is observed rent declines or changes in select US cities, March to December of last year. So this is March to December of 2020. Look at the left-hand column here. Between March and December of last year, rents in San Francisco falling 27%, Seattle 22%, Boston 21%, New York 20%, Washington 15%. Proximity became less valuable. Now, rents are not declining everywhere. If you look at the right-hand column, Memphis, Texas, rents are rising. Arlington, Texas, same thing. Memphis, Tennessee, rents are rising. Uh, Arlington, Texas, rents are rising. So what's going on here? We economists have done a good job talking about the fact that many people are moving from cities to suburbs we spent less time talking about the fact that many people are moving from more expensive areas to less expensive areas. Here's another way of looking at this. This purple, this dark purple line that goes to the bottom here reflects the rent change or rent decline sustained in principal cities over the 12 months of last year. So pretty significant decline in principal city rents. The light purple line represents the rent changes in suburban cities. That's not where you see the decline at least for most of last year. So I'm from Baltimore. Our, so our suburban cities are the likes of Columbia, Ellicott City, Towson, Pikesville, Cadenceville, Hunt Valley, Lutherville, Westminster, Bel Air, Severna Park, Annapolis, Glen Burnie. I could go on, I think I am, White March. The point is, that's not where the population is leaving. The population is leaving principal cities. And I think even after the pandemic, that will continue to a certain extent because the millennials are now ready to move to the suburbs and take on homeownership in growing numbers. You can see this also in the Washington DC housing market. Uh, this is average days on market. Uh, in 2015, it took about 85 days on average to sell a house. In March of 2021, about 31 days. And I'm sure you've heard about homes being sold within, you know, on the day that it's listed for sale, those kinds of things, and bidding wars breaking out because the inventory of unsold homes is very low. Now, what about commercial construction? So this is one of the favorite leading indicators for commercial construction. This is the Architecture Billings Index. It's based on a survey of architects conducted each and every month by the American Institute of Architects. You see the 50 yard line running west is across that slide. Of course, the NFL draft is coming up, but you see that 50 yard line? Any reading less than 50 means that architects are generally less busy now than they were the previous month. Now you can see that for many, many months recently, architects were busy getting less busy. February and March was a turnaround. The economy is turning around. Architects are starting to get busy again, working on projects that had been mothballed. But in general, architects are not as busy as they had been pre-crisis. And one of the reasons for that, of course, relates to all this retail vacancy. So the demand for new retail construction is down. Let's drill down on this further. As defined by the U.S. Census Bureau, there are 16 categories of non-residential construction in our country. All are listed here. Uh, and these horizontal bars represent the percentage change in construction spending for the five-year period spanning from February of 2015 to February of 2020. Five-year period. So what am I doing here? Why stop with February of 2020? Because again, that's the last pre-pandemic month. So what I'm trying to show you here is what was constructed in large amounts during the five years leading up to the pandemic. At number one, lodging. What's that about? New hotel room construction for the most part. We built a ton of hotels just before a global pandemic that shut down leisure travel and business travel alike. Now, leisure travel will come back with a vengeance going forward for reasons we can get into, but business travel, not so sure for obvious reasons. Many companies are looking at uh, broken balance sheets. They're trying to conserve cash. And one way to conserve cash, of course, is to cut back on travel expenditures. 
office space. We built a ton of office space coming into this pandemic. But now we know that many people are as productive or more productive working remotely. And in many instances, many workers are happier working remotely. And I would say that currently, and then going into the future, many potential employees are going to demand greater flexibility, these hybrid models from their employers, requiring from their employer that they be able to work two or three days a week from home. Now, I mean, you say the employer has the ultimate power, right? Yeah, maybe, but given labor and skill shortages of the future, and they're gonna be uh, pretty profound, given the low labor force participation rate and the fact that baby boomers are retiring in large numbers, employees are gonna have some negotiating power, and a lot of that negotiating power will be used not just to raise wages and benefits, but also to argue for more flexibility, including where they work. Now, this fast forwards the data, same 16 categories, but now this is for the one year period spanning from February of 2020 to February of 2021. Uh, we don't yet have the March construction spending data that will come out uh, in early May. But if you look at the bottom here, at the very bottom is lodging. Lodging. That's hotel room construction. So again, the market's already responding and we'll see how the hotel market responds. We'll see how the retail sector responds. We'll see how the office market responds. But in terms of demand for new construction, that's going to be lower uh, during uh, the years ahead, I would suspect. And I would say that commercial real estate and construction will be among the slowest segments of the economy to fully recover, but we can explore uh, more of this during Q and A. So let me um, end this section by talking about some of the Washington DC submarket data. So too much data on here by half, I recognize that. But if you look at the third and fourth numeric columns where it says net absorption, so toward the middle of the slide, you can see that in 2020, if you look toward the bottom here, we saw the net absorption of, uh, net absorption of negative 1.4 million square feet in 2020. And then in the first quarter of 2021 alone, 1.1 million square feet were vacated uh, in three months, 1.1 million uh, square feet. And this will continue, why? Because each and every month, some fraction of leases come up for renewal and many CEOs will make the, the, the decision, I don't want to renew this lease, I need less space, I want cheaper space. Indeed, if you look at the vacancy rates here, for instance, on Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill is at the top here, that Capitol Hill marketplace with 5.6 million square feet of inventory, they have the, that's the highest gross asking rent, right? Washington DC power corridor, $71 a square foot and an overall vacancy rate of 32%. So what's happening there, you know, massive negative net absorption during the first quarter of more than half a million square feet, a negative net absorption. Why? Because CEOs are deciding, I don't need to be in very expensive space. More of my workers are working remotely. I'm trying to improve my balance sheet. I'm moving someplace else. Okay. So let's do some crystal ball in here, the forecast. Now we economists have a tendency to excessively complicate matters in an attempt to make ourselves look smarter than we are. But really economics is pretty basic when you come right down to it. There are really two pieces to economics. Demand and supply, that's all you get. Demand and supply. And from an American perspective, the bulk of demand comes from the American household. It's consumer spending. You've heard the statement a thousand times probably, the consumer is two thirds of the economy. What they really are, of course, is two thirds of aggregate demand. And that's why we monitor consumer psychology so carefully. We measure their confidence. We wonder if they're happy with the president. This is the University of Michigan's Index of Consumer Sentiment. And consumer sentiment is almost precisely where you, where you would think it would be. So when the folks in Michigan are not being hammered by Ohio State, they like to produce this index. And what it says is that, yeah, consumers are not as uh, underconfident as they had been earlier in the crisis, but they're not as confident as they had been pre-pandemic. Um, they're exactly where you, they're, where you would think they would be. But here's the thing. I could make the argument pretty easily that household balance sheets in America have never been in better shape. Now that sounds awfully ins uh, insensitive. After all, many Americans are facing eviction, having fallen behind on the rent, eviction once these various moratoria expire. Many of them are facing food insecurity, going to food pantries for the first time in their lives to eat. Uh, others lost health insurance uh, when they needed it most during this crisis. But there are another group of American households who've taken this opportunity to amass significant savings and to improve their household balance sheet, this is the US savings rate. This is savings as a percentage of personal disposal income. I'm graphing for you 16 years of data. Now, what is this basically? This is basically the amount of money that people take out of their paychecks every couple of weeks and put into some savings account or a 401k, but they're not spending it right away. That's the point. 
They're not spending it right away. Now, coming into the crisis, your savings rate is around 7 to 8%. By April of 2020, that's the big peak you see here, it's 33.7%. What's going on here? Well, people are getting stimulus checks. Many people don't lose their jobs. They're still getting income. Other people are getting stepped up unemployment insurance benefits from the federal government. 68% of those folks were getting those $600 supplements each week from the federal government. We're making more on unemployment than they had on their previous job or they had been on the previous job. So money is coming to the household, but it's not money easily spent. Malls are closed, restaurants are closed, ballparks, so on and so forth. As the economy reopens, those savings turn to expenditures, the economy takes off. But as late as February of 2021, the savings rate is still a lofty 13.6%. And this predates the Biden stimulus package of March, which sent further checks to Americans. And of course, we're adding more jobs also, 916,000 in March. So income is going up. Part of the economy is shut down and the savings continues to be elevated. So this is a very positive factor for growth going forward. What is the short-term constraint? The short-term constraint is on the supply side. So we've got a lack of, a lack of uh, computer chips. So we can't get place, Sony PlayStation 5s and auto manufacturers can't build as many units as they would like. You know, we have very expensive software lumber prices, steel, aluminum prices. We have a higher freight uh, prices. All of this is because of buckling supply chains. We also have a lack of small business confidence in America. This is the National Federation of Independent Businesses Index of Small Business Optimism. Question, small business entrepreneur, is it a good time to expand your business over the next three months? Answer, no, it is not. In March of 2021, only 11% of small business operators said yes to this question. It's a good time to expand my business. In February, it was 6%. Many of these small business operators are hoarding cash. They're not ready to expand. And expanding under the current circumstances would mean getting back toward what they looked like in February of 2020 before the crisis became one in North America. So the supply side is still constrained. And this will show up in the form in the near term, at least, of constrained hiring. Uh, and of course, many employers also complain that they can't find workers when they are ready to begin hiring. So the supply side is still constrained. So final slide here, the sourcer's outlook. For an economy to flourish, both demand and supply sides of the economy must participate. Additional stimulus is forthcoming, and we just received more stimulus last month. So demand continues to get a boost, but supply continues to be constrained by ongoing lockdown measures, and not just in America. This is a global economic phenomenon. You can see what's happening in India, South Africa, Ireland, England, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, other places around the world, Canada. So the result is that in the near term, your savings rate will continue to be elevated, it will climb from that 13.6% level I talked about for February, and that will spring load the economy for rapid economic growth as these vaccines become more broadly available. And the upshot of all of this is that the back half of 2021 should be simply spectacular for economic growth, unlike anything you've seen in your lives, unless you're from Dubai. However, there will be a day of reckoning as deficit hawks come back into fashion, creating the possibility of greater austerity during the years ahead. The natural debt will come back and bite us. That's my prediction. That's what economics would tell me. I could be wrong, but we shall see. That's what economic theory says, at least the economic theory I studied in school. And with that, let's open up for Q&A. I, oh. I did. Hold on. Did you see it? The, hold on. Let me get the question. I can read it for the audience. All right. The first question that we had posed was, how do you explain the markets doing so well currently? Do you see hyperinflation in the next several years, five to 10? We've printed a lot of money. How will US dollar devaluation impact US or us? Right, and, and I, I, I think that that's really uh, three questions. And so let me answer them in turn. So first, how do we explain that the markets are doing so well? The NASDAQ is sitting about 14,000, the Dow Industrials, even though it's down today, sitting at 33,000, 837.73, so on so How do we explain it? Look, there are two ways to try to analyze the value of shares, the, the value of corporate shares. One way is the old-fashioned method. You know, the, the value of a corporate share is the uh, discounted value of future corporate earnings divided by the number of shares outstanding. And of course, corporate earnings have been strong during this crisis. Businesses have been very aggressively cost-cutting when they needed to. And some businesses have taken advantage of the pandemic, like Zoom, DocuSign, others, Apple, Tesla. Um, to expand their market share, to expand their market reach. 
But there's another way of looking at share prices, which is to say supply and demand. At any given moment, there are only so many shares available to buy, and there is a demand. And demand for shares has been massive. Why? Because the U.S. savings rate has been so high. So if you're saving a lot of money, you've got to put that money someplace. Why not the U.S. stock market? Millennials, of course, are very eager to buy stock. You can see that Reddit crowd buying GameStop and silver and so on and so forth. They're very interested in buying equities. But other investors have had lots of savings, too, to pour into the stock market. So it's really supply and demand at some level. And so with so much liquidity continuing to be injected by the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world, I don't think stock prices are ready to fall anytime soon, though we could argue that stock prices are stretched based on historic price earnings ratios. Do you see hyperinflation in the next several years? Not hyperinflation. The global economy is too flexible, and at some point these supply chains will become more orderly around the world as we get to that post-pandemic world. Right now, a lot of supply chains have been interfered with, with ongoing trade disputes, but also with COVID-19 and workers becoming uh, infected uh, by, the, by the virus. So I don't expect hyperinflation. What I do expect to see, however, is more inflation than it, we're comfortable with. So for four decades, since Paul Volcker was Federal Reserve Chairman, six foot seven inch Paul Volcker, the tallest Federal Reserve Chairman in American history, who stomped out inflation during the early 1980s. Two recessions in the early 1980s was the price of that, and then set the stage for four, uh, four decades of low cost of capital and this economic boom that we've experienced, 80s, 90s, into the 2000s during the previous decade. I give Paul Volcker more credit than any other human being for that, for that performance of the past four decades. We won't see hyperinflation like we did in the 1970s or we saw in Latin America, uh, you know, in the 60s, so on so forth. But what I would expect to see is more inflation the Federal Reserve is prepared to handle. And so the Federal Reserve at some point is going to have to start tapering, you know, in other words, slowing down the quantitative easing, the bond purchasing, and actually raise interest rates. Uh, now, they're, they're, they're going to try to hold the line on interest rates until the year 2023 or 2024, but inflationary pressure, I think, will force their hand before they really want to. Uh, and so some of this inflationary pressure is transitory. It's based on the global economy reopening uh, and supply chain still in disarray. But some of that is permanent and is a function of all this money supply that's been created by central banks around the world, which brings me to the third question, who printed a lot of money, how will U.S. dollar devaluation impact us? Look, the U.S. dollar is the best house in a bad neighborhood. Let's think about what the other global currencies are. Let's start with the Japanese yen. The Japanese yen is defended by a national economy that doesn't grow as fast as ours, by a population that is shrinking, um, and, and a country that has a higher debt to GDP ratio than we have. What about the Chinese renminbi? Well, the problem is, of course, that's not a free floating currency. It can't really operate uh, as the global reserve currency. What about the euro? Really? The euro? Very short history there. And the euro is really very tenuous. Uh, as, you know, the Eurozone is really very tenuous in terms of this straight relationship between Germany uh, and many other nations, whether Greece, Portugal, Spain, so on and so forth. The Canadian dollar, there's not enough Canadian dollars in circulation, not enough Swiss francs, not enough Australian dollars. Uh, you know, Indian rupee is not a challenger. The, the British pound is not a challenger. So when you look around, best house in the bad neighborhood, the U.S. dollar continues to retain its preeminence, though we continue to mismanage the dollar. That's true. But again, best house in a bad neighborhood. Go ahead and ask me the next question, if you'd like. Another question. There has been an increase in costs of materials, lumber, et cetera. Can you further explain the causes for those increased costs and when you see these costs going back down? Right. So this is a combination of two things. One, very robust demand, including for softwood lumber, as the U.S. single-family housing construction sector, construction sector took off. You'll remember that supply capacity was truncated a bit in North America by those trade disputes between the Americans and the Canadians. This picked up during the Trump administration, but for decades now, American softwood lumber prices, uh, uh, American softwood lumber producers have been sparring with Canadian softwood lumber producers, and occasionally government has gotten involved and has interfered with market uh, uh, performance and or supply capacity augmentation. And then, of course, with COVID-19, uh, it's been difficult for many factories to continue to operate smoothly uh, as some members of the team uh, get sick and then other members are exposed to them. And so, not enough supply. 
a lot of demand, and what do you have? You have these home builders putting in their stuff with lumber package orders in large numbers, and the supply is not there, so what has to happen? The price has to go up. Similar things have happened with steel, aluminum, copper, tin, uh, over the course of the pandemic. I would expect that later this year, you'll start to see some equilibration. At some point, we get into the post-pandemic world, and the supply side begins to respond more efficiently uh, and is able to handle uh, uh, more efficiently or more effectively uh, the surge in demand. How do you think the U.S. will end up paying its $23 trillion plus of debt? So now the debt is actually $28 trillion, if you include all the money that's owed to, for instance, the Social Security Trust Fund, $28 trillion. I don't think we need to pay it back, literally. What we need to demonstrate to the bond markets, uh, the prospective bond purchasers, and of course, people who hold U.S. Treasuries, is that we have some sense or semblance of fiscal discipline in Washington, D.C. Of course, there's none of that right now. But given the liquidity in the marketplace and the lack of available assets to purchase, uh, many people still continue to buy U.S. Treasuries despite those, uh, those, those low yields. So there's not a short-term crisis. When might the crisis, the bond market revolt come? When, when might that day of reckoning come? I have some choices for you. 2026, which is the year that the uh, Medicare trust fund is set to go insolvent, according to the most recent trustees report. At that point, there'll be a lot of attention paid to the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, budget deficit and the U.S. federal budget uh, budget generally. Uh, and there'll be, need to be some evidence that the folks in Washington, D.C. can act as full-fledged adults. 2030 is a year you'll hear many economists quote. A lot of economists... I think it's voodoo economics. They, they believe in these cycles and that every year, number of years, 70 years, 80 years, 150 years, we have a financial crisis. And so 2030 is a year uh, where many of those economists uh, think that we'll have a crisis. I, I just, I don't believe in it, but anything is possible. And then 2035 is the year that the Social Security Trust Fund is set to go insolvent, though many people think it will happen sooner than that. So around that decade, 2026 to 2035, I think you will see that day uh, of reckoning, and we're going to have to see either austerity from the federal government, meaning lower spending, higher taxes, or they're just going to print money and pay back the debt, uh, at least in part, just by printing more money and debasing the currency, which, by the way, other nations might be doing at the same time. So it might not really change our relative currency valuation. More questions posted. We'll try to get through these. Do you feel there will be another housing bubble in the near horizon? Uh, this question is asked by Tracy. Very good question. I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. What does it come down to again? Supply and demand. So back in 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, as that housing bubble was, uh, was being created, we built a ton of new homes, a ton of them. Uh, and so even as we're adding to supply, prices kept rising. This time around is different. Yeah, we're building more homes, but nothing like we were building in 2004, 2005 in terms of number of homes. And, and if you look at the supply-demand equilibrium, we still don't have enough supply out there. The buyers are frustrated, heading to the sidelines because housing has become so expensive because it's in such limited supply. So unless we get a major uh, increase in single-family permitting and single-family construction, I think supply-demand will, will, uh, uh, will support current valuations. Now, the one exception here would be this. If you see a massive increase or a significant increase in mortgage rates, then, of course, home prices will likely fall. But I don't think it's a bubble bursting. I don't think we have a bubble based on supply and demand considerations. Do you see local governments in the D.C. area using their stimulus funds more for short-term or long-term rainy day infrastructure uses? Okay, I would say this, that I would prefer that they use the money long-term because when you get so much money in a short amount of time, it's very easy to waste that money. Think about the typical lottery winner and how long it takes for them to go bankrupt. So, um, so I would hope that they would spend the money over the long term, but they're on four-year election cycles. So guess what they're probably going to do? They're going to spend a lot of that money in the short term, right? What's their number one job of a politician? Get reelected. So I know that sounds cynical, but that's my expectation, that a lot of this money will be spent in the, spent in the short term. In Baltimore, we got $600 million. And based on our history, I think we're probably going to squander it. I hope I'm wrong about that. But again, I've become cynical looking at public policymakers over time. Do you anticipate individuals, companies begin deploying the capital reserves, savings they've been building during the pandemic? I think consumers, based on what we've seen over the past year, start doing that almost immediately. They're looking for opportunities to spend. They're going to spend on vacations. Uh, you know, many of them have bought a second or third home. And that's been part of the strong housing market story that we have observed. Uh, corporations, I think, are, you know, um, 
uh, are more reserved. You know, they're looking at longer term corporate earnings and you know, looking to use their capital efficiently and effectively. You will see an increase in capital spending going forward. And of course, one of the things the corporations are thinking about is what happens if corporate taxes are increased, which is the proposal on the table and probably will happen. So I think corporations will be slower to start infusing the economy with more spending. You will see some increase in investment, but not like consumer spending. Consumer spending is really going to take off uh, over the next few months. It was a surprise that the chart indicates it's a bad time for small businesses to expand. With pent up demand and lots of competition closing, wouldn't it be a good time for small businesses to grow? Absolutely. I think it's a time for small business operators, and I'm a small business owner. You know, unlike most economists, I make payroll every two weeks. I've got payroll on Friday. Uh, do I think it's a good time to expand my business? You betcha. Uh, absolutely, because there is a tsunami of demand coming. This economy is about to reopen. It's a good time to be on the front foot. But a lot of business operators have been really hit hard by the pandemic. Think about restaurant operators, especially retailers, these kinds of folks, even some construction firms, uh, you know, suffering from uh, lower backlog and project postponements and cancellations. So, you know, they're nervous and they're trying to hoard cash right now. Uh, and I think ultimately they'll see that as a mistake because their competitors will be on the front foot and they'll have an opportunity to take their market share away uh, from businesses that are more reserved in their investment. Uh, these are, we one more popped up, so we'll take these last two and then we are gonna move into our networking session. What are your thoughts on the future of cryptocurrencies? Will it continue to appreciate in the near long term? Tough one, I mean, look, Everything in economics taught me that these cryptocurrencies should have no value whatsoever. And indeed, I've, I've watched Bitcoin trading at 56,000 today, uh, wondering where, from where it derives its value. I'm, said, I'm told that it is the currency of the internet. But I tell you, when I buy on Amazon, my, um, my credit card just works just fine, as does my PayPal. So, um, but nonetheless, I can see what's happening. That increasingly, Bitcoin, which is at 55,882.98, as I'm speaking to you, has become um, uh, a, a way to store value. Uh, it has replaced gold for many people and is often referred to as digital gold. Uh, and so with all this liquidity, this high savings rate, many people skeptical about equity prices and bonds. I think you're going to continue to see a lot of demand for cryptocurrencies and not just Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Cosmos, Stella Lumens, all these other cryptocurrencies that have become more popular over time as well. Your early slide showed China's growth in 2020. Do you see the trend conti continuing into 2021 and outpace everyone in the next 10 years? Uh, not everyone. I mean, if you're talking about percentage growth or the absolute increase in the size of the economy, uh, I would say that over the longer term, China's rate of growth will slow. Their population is aging very rapidly now. They have amassed a lot of public debt, including in municipal governments. Uh, there's going to be a lot of reshoring out of China, a lot of anger towards China, including among American CEOs who imagine a decoupling of the U.S. and Chinese economies. So they ultimately will be the largest economy in the world. They have 1.3 to 1.4 billion people. We Americans only have around 335 million people. And so at some point, China will surpass us. But I don't think the growth rate is going to be what it has been in the past. Um, they'll be one of the fastest growing countries in the world, but no, no longer the fastest. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm trying to turn my camera back on. Thank you very much, Anubhan. We appreciate your time. Excellent presentation. And uh, also to the audience, really great questions and made the presentation flow very well. So I think we stayed right on time.